We like to think that the mind is in charge of the body. And yet when you look at the way most of us live our lives, it's, it seems like the body is in charge. We worry about feeding it, giving it a place to sleep, all these other things that we decide that the body needs. Food, clothing, shelter, medicine. And that's not half of it. There are all the other things we think the body needs as well. And when you really look at the body, there's not that much there, like the chant we had just now. I young coal make I know this body of mine. And you take the parts one by one by one, and there's really nothing much there. And you begin to wonder what's there to get all worked up about. And yet when you try to use this meditation to give the mind a little bit more freedom, there's a big resistance. Because there's something in the mind that likes to be attached to the body. We say, well, we get a certain amount of pleasure out of the body. When you really look at that pleasure, though, again, there's not that much, not that much to it. All the pleasure you've gotten out of the body in the past, where is it now? It's just in memories. And a lot of times that kind of pleasure, the memory of that pleasure, is not a happy memory. We talk about our physical needs, and it's not really so much what the body needs, it's what the mind makes up in its idea about the body. In order to survive, the body just needs a few things. It needs a little bit of food, a little bit of shelter, and it's okay. And even that much the body doesn't ask for. As far as the physical elements in the body are concerned, the body could die, no big deal. But it's a big deal for the mind because the mind identifies so much with the body. Pleasure comes felt in the body, well, the mind identifies with the pleasure. Pain comes, the mind identifies with the pain. So we meditate on the 32 parts of the body as a beginning way of getting to understand the mind. Why is the mind so attached to this physical heap we've got here? And we meditate on the 32 parts to get a little bit more perspective. As I said, there's not that much there. And if you were to take the parts out and arrange them on the floor, what would you do? You'd probably run away. Couldn't stand to look at them. Couldn't stand to smell them. And yet when they're all sewed up in the skin like we're sitting right here right now, they seem to be all right. No big deal. And we know those parts are in there, and yet there's a part of the mind huge part of the mind that creates a big blind spot. And this blind spot, that's ignorance. That's why we suffer. It's this mind's the mind's ability to create blind spots. Just the way surgeons can you know, open up bodies and then go back home and sleep with their wives or their husbands or whatever, and compartmentalize reality. So what they saw on the operating table has nothing to do with them, how they live the rest of their lives. And it's because of this that we suffer. We give so much importance to certain sensations, so much importance to certain feelings in the body. And we, and we blame the body on, well, it was because I had this physical need, I had to do that. Lust is a big liar in that way. The body doesn't need that. It's the mind that wants it. And so you can't blame the body, it's all in the mind. So at first we meditate on the 32 parts to get a better sense of perspective and realize that one, there's not that much there, and two, it's not the body's fault that the mind is so enslaved. The mind has enslaved itself to the body. So once you can pull yourself away a little bit from that attachment and really look at the mind's habits there, that's when you really start gaining useful insights into why there is clinging, why there is attachment. You take the sources of clinging apart. There's clinging for sensuality, that's clinging to your passions. Remember, you're not clinging so much to the actual sensations, you're clinging to the passion itself. The sensations are just an excuse. They, in and of themselves, <clears throat> are not poisonous at all, they're not harmful in one way or another. 
but it's what the mind does to them. That's what's poisonous to the mind. That's what creates the suffering. It's your passion for your intentions. That's what the Buddha says is sensuality. So you have to look at those. In order to look at them, again, you have to separate the intentions, the ideas of the mind, from the objects. It's just like when you're dealing with anger. You learn how to look, have to learn how to look at anger as a state in and of the mind. So first you have to pry your attention away from the object of the anger so you can look at the anger as a mental event. And it's the same with lust and passion. You have to pry your attachment away from the object so you can start looking at the actual passion, the actual intentions in the mind, to see them for what they are, to realize, well, that why do you want to get involved in these things? And then there are other types of clinging as well, clinging to precepts and practices, clinging to views, clinging to ideas about who you are, what yourself is. That's what the, the classical list. But the big ones you've got to deal with are the attachment to sensuality. Most people want to skip over those. There's a conference going on in New York later this year on Buddhism, and there's a one of the discussion panels is going to be on renunciation. Now, when the Buddha talked about renunciation, he was talking about renouncing sex, renouncing sensual passions of all kinds. And everybody wants to skip over that. They say, let's go to a more profound level, the renunciation of selfishness renunciation of the I attitude or whatever. Well, you can't renounce that until you've taken apart sensuality. You're not going to understand the sense of I until you've taken apart your sensual attractions, your sensual passions. So this is why we've got to focus a lot of energy on this issue, because otherwise the mind will never be free. It will always be a slave to its passions. And it'll blame the body, it'll blame just anything it can think of. But the real danger lies within. It's one of the asavas, one of these things that comes flowing out of the mind. And if we're not careful, it turns into a flood and carries us off. So you've got to stem the flood from the very beginning by seeing that it all comes down to things that are really not that much. A little urge appears in the mind. There's a sensation that feels good, either the eyes, you know, eyes, ears, and down through the senses. And yet the mind is able to build up so much around those things. You have to look at the mind's ability to create, and also the mind's ability to turn a blind eye. Because wherever, wherever there's passion, a blind eye is being turned to something. Because the body, when you really look at it, to what it really is. You have to be blind to an awful lot of it to be attracted to it. So we very patiently go through the parts, very patiently watch when anger arises, we watch when passion arises, just to see these things as separate events, not create them and not turn them into big issues, put them all together. The more you put them together, the more overwhelming and more powerful they seem. But when you start taking them apart, saying, well, what was that feeling of passion based on? Well, it was just this little thing here and that little thing there, this little feeling here, that little idea there. And on their own, there's nothing much. But it's our ability to turn a blind eye to the fact that there's nothing much to them. That's when we can create things out of them. So you have to watch out for this tendency of the mind to create issues where there's really no need for an issue at all. And as we said last night, this blind eye, this blind spot we have in the mind, it's not just a big empty spot. There are lots of strange ideas in there, lots of strange assumptions that we have to learn how to take apart. We have to learn how to dethink our thinking, take apart our assumptions. Is it really true that the body is worth being attached to? It's useful as a tool. Without the body, we couldn't do the practice. But beyond that, what real good does the mind get out of it? And John Sweat often like to say, ask that question I asked earlier in the talk. Think of all the sensory pleasures you've had in the past. Where are they now? They're gone. 
What's left is just a memory. And sometimes the memory of a past pleasure is a painful memory. So where does all this get the mind, aside from just keeping it in the round so it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back, never finding satisfaction, never coming to a point of completion at all. Though in completion is when you pull away, build up qualities of mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment in the mind. Start taking these as food for the mind rather than looking through old trash bins for your food. Because the food that comes from the practice, that's the kind of food that can make the mind strong enough so that one day it can stand on its own. It doesn't need to feed on anything else. It's not deluded into thinking that it has to feed on anything else. It's got everything it needs inside. So this is why that chant is repeated so often, every morning when we have a chant. This, this ayan ko me gayo, this body of mind. Because the mind is so slow to pick up this message, but it's such an important message. This is our big attachment sitting right here, and it's the most blatant one. And if you don't, can't deal with the most blatant attachment right here, there's no way you're going to get to the subtle ones. So think about this. It's, it's not only a topic for discernment, it's also a topic for concentration. As you think about these things, it helps the mind calm down. When you get in a good state of concentration, it, when you've got this kind of thinking in the background, it helps keep the mind in that concentration. And then, of course, the more concentrated you are, the more subtle the discernment comes to pick up on these attachments, to pick up on the way the mind lies to itself. So the two qualities go hand in hand, tranquility and insight. As a way of bringing the mind to freedom. So it no longer has to be a slave to its ideas about the body. It can instead be totally independent. 